Hey, it's DBJ, and what got me thinking about this uh, topic, about the five types of role-playing gamers out there, had me thinking about uh, movies, because I love movies, and um, every time you go see it, go to the movies, or you rent a movie, and there's a trailer, and usually before the movie or trailer starts, it'll, you know, it'll give you a rating, like rating R, NC-17, PG-13. Uh, when you buy a video game or you look at a re um, preview of a video game, it'll have like, you know, rated for mature audiences. And it had me thinking about this aspect for role-playing games. And I'm just giving you my thought process on this. And I was wondering, like, I wonder if we could establish in the role-playing community, um, as far as social contracts go, um, a very easy, very simple way to say, like, hey, um, my game's going to have a lot of role-playing, 50% uh, you know, social interaction, 25% combat, and um, we're going to deep immerse. Or you could say, listen, this is going to be a meat grinder, uh, you know, 12% role-playing, um, 82%, you know, uh, um, tactical combat, so come prepared with a character. Or, this game will have um, pre-gens, uh, setting is going to be important, so you should, you know, you're going to need to know about 30% of the setting, whatever. Something like that, right? And uh, and this comes comes to me from the, the excellent, excellent um, use of the... Uh, the OSG, the One Shot Group, a uh, Facebook group, and how everyone has gotten into a to be able to sell their game, make a simple, concise idea of what that game will will be. People can join in or not, but every once in a while, you'll get a thread on there where someone's like, "Well, hey, I came to the game with character X, but the game is about setting Y." And sometimes it can be a little bit of miscommunication. That being said, I did not make up, you know, a a um, a, a viewer rating for how we could do this. But it, this is my thought process. So this was really sp um, spawned to me from uh, Rune Slinger, who has um, very thoughtful, very logical, um, well thought out and um, uh, examples of role playing techniques. And this goes all the way, all the way back to the, to the thread about, you know, fudging dice and those kind of things. It, uh, we're beyond that. So what I'm going to do is give you my five types of role-playing game styles. And I'd love to hear people's, uh, some video comments or some comments in general, or even create a discussion. And I'd love to see on a scale of one to ten or... You can do percentile of 100%. Which percentage do you find yourself falling into? So, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, you say, well, you know what? I'm a 2 in this. I'm a 4 in that. You know, and I'm also a 4 in this. Or, you know, I'm probably about a 2 even all the way across the board. So, let's start with the 5. Um, the 5 are an immersionist, narrationist, interpreter interpretationist, uh, simulationist, and operationist. Um, I have specifically picked words that um, are, do not quite flow off the tongue, but I wanted it to completely encapsulate the idea. So that's why I said interpretationist as, as opposed to interpretist. Um, anyway, again, immersionist, narrationist, interpretationist, simulationist, and operationist. Okay, so let, let's start with number one, the immersionist. Um, the immersionist role player um, leans very far away from the rules and is far more interested in uh, character development, setting, the interaction of themselves with the other players in the group, uh, the dynamic interaction they have with the NPCs, and an almost um, 
there's no clock ticking in an immersionist role playing. For so, for example, the player group you know love to use Dungeons and Dragons as a typical thing. Hey, you all you guys meet in a bar. An immersionist would never feel like they have to hurry up to gain any information to leave the tavern to go on the adventure. Whatever interactions they have with the players, with the NPCs, the people in the town, um, as they start to learn people's names, they learn backgrounds of the characters. Um, immersionists have far more fun immersing themselves into the world without a timetable. And they can, an immersionist would, would absolutely say, hey, listen, we've had three game sessions and we never rolled one die. It's more, an immersionist loves improv. They love that organic uh, development of learning backgrounds and fears and hopes and dreams. This is not to say an immersionist doesn't um, appreciate combat. An immersionist, when an immersionist runs combat, they are the ones that absolutely utilize everything from the sweat dripping off their brow, the blood pouring down uh, the hilt of the sword, the crunch of bone as they use a blunt weapon to strike their, their enemies. And like in movies, when you hear like slow motion, you have narrative as, the, as a, a narrator speaks to the, uh, the audience as the character engages in something, the immersionist is able to take a single minute of time frame and stretch it out so that it encomp en encapsulates everything. It is the, the idea that a single blink of an eye or a single heartbeat, that there are a thousand and one things that happen all at the same time. Let us explore all of those things in that single heartbeat. You know, feeling the um, adrenaline, having knowing that the player is yet afraid but must confront their fears when when fighting a villain. And because of this, the immersionist is able to take three rounds of combat, a couple of die rolls, first level characters, and completely immerse themselves, I'm using the same word, um, and the other players at the table into the the drama that unfolds. Uh, the immersionist loves aftermath. What happens after the combat? The the smell of flies, the 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 maggots, you know, growing on the, the the desiccated bodies, you know, days after the battle. The 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 once pristine plains and and grasslands now stained with red, so that there's this muddy red all over the battlefield, and how it you know, seeps and, and smells and, and feels and tastes. The immersionist also um, is very much into the setting, the politics, the language, the, the foods, the music, festivals and holidays, of uh, family dynamics, um, child rearing. The, the immersionist wants to know and both um, support the the environment and the setting, yet at the same time come into conflict with it. Hey, my PC is from a different place in a different world. What, am, for example, uh, in the book Shogun, European sailor, you know, goes to Japan, and how that culture clash happens, and how, you know, how long does it take to learn the culture? Do they never learn the culture? Um, does the, the PC um, offend someone, and how do they make amends for that offense? How do they, um, are they going to be hated enemies in this community? And then how does that, their uh, connections and or um, conflict with the community extend over the life of the game? The immersionist is more interested in building relationships, building um, rivals, having a nemesis, um, having far more impact in the political scheme of the world than, than any die rolling, 
you know, coin counting, any numerical effects at all. That is not to say they wouldn't, but the goal of the immersionist is to say, hey, uh, my character, I'm going to take a simple piece of paper, my character sheet, the numbers, and turn it into a living, breathing being so that when next someone asks me, hey, how did that game go? I can describe for them essentially a novel, a book, a movie, um, someone that is living and breathing with so much um, background and so much detail that they seem like a real living person. The second type is the narrationist. And the narrationist is um, a role player that not necessarily um, uses I. I am doing my, they are more into my character is, those characters are, we are. The narrationist is very much into uh, using um, literature styles of, um, of conflict and rising states of, um, of not immersion, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my words. Um, the narrationist loves a, a path and pattern of rising to the climax and ending on, say, cliffhangers. They like a pattern. Um, simple conflict, medium conflict, very tough conflict. They, the narrationist likes to have a, um, a pattern of motion. This is chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Fade to blacks, slow motion, um, soliloquy, and the narrationist is very much into, instead of each person portraying their characters in character, as opposed to improv, is more or less um, sharing a tabletop story that is done organically. Like, almost as if getting together with a number of individuals, and each person gets to write a different chapter or line or paragraph in the story and add to that organically. You know, it would be, I, I write down one line to, to write a novel and then I pass that line to each individual around the, the table or hangouts and each person gets to add their thing. So by the time it gets back to me, I now have to, I now want to grow and add to this story, but five other lines in this paragraph have been added that, and I'm not sure what they're going to add to it. But the narrationist, um, as opposed to, using the example, going to the tavern and just never leaving the tavern for three, for three games, or um, instead of going on an adventure, setting up a, a business, the narrationist is uh, far more interested in saying, hey, we are a group of uh, heroes, and the climax of the story will be defeating the dragon." We will, we will organically spend one third of our time in the city, another third of our time traveling. The last third of our time will be take place in the the big cavern where we fight the dragon. And so, the narrationist begins to use the clock, the ticking clock, a little bit more than the uh, than completely ignoring it as the immersionist would. The narrationist goes, "Hey, we are going to have dynamic interaction." We're going to talk, we're going to learn about our backgrounds, but not to the detriment of moving to the next chapter. Hey, we're going to interact, we're going to go to the tavern. Um, we, the narration is, is far more comfortable metagaming some things. Oh, there is a new individual we've met. Hi there, stranger in the tavern. Why don't you travel with us? You seem like someone that is a hardy adventurer. Um, the narration is far more comfortable uh, metagaming those portions of it because they are going to essentially write a script for a movie with all and all those involved will add to that that element and yes using all the techniques of the immersionists um, as far as um, internal dialogue uh, fears and hopes and getting involved in politics uh, the narrationist knows that all of those things are important but cannot stop the flow of progression to the climax. And the narrationist, as far as die rolling and numbers go, will take 
will tend to use numbers as a back seat, thereby not even having die rolls if it does not further the, the pace of getting to the next chapter. Um, the third type of role player is the interpretationist. And the interpretationist is not so much limited by um, a literary or movie or media dynamic. So an interpretationist tends to fall f far more in line with uh, using the die, die and using the rules and using the numbers. And the interpretationist tends to uh, use the die rolls the numbers and, and those elements, those mechanical elements in the setting, and then interprets those same numbers into what the setting brings. So, for example, as opposed to an immersionist who maybe goes into the tavern, wants to talk to those in a tavern, success or failure is completely based on what is said and what is done and the interaction of the players. They're, they're in, an immersionist would almost never roll any dice for, say, a social interaction. An narrationist, because it is not necessary to further the plot, would never pick up the dice in those, those social interactions. We're going to interact with those in the tavern. At some point, someone will give some information as to go to the next chapter. No die rolling. The interpretationist will have those interactions. People will talk with each other. The characters will meet together, they will start to converse, we will roll dice, find out what the die roll is for that social interaction, whether it is success or failure, and then interpret what happens from that success or failure and move on from there. The, the difference from uh, the narrationist and the in interpretationist is that success or failure is not of paramount importance. For, to interpret what the dot dice are. If there is a failure, that failure is just part and parcel of, the, of how the game runs and move on from there. Whether, whether that means that there is a loss of information that is an important clue, whether that means um, somehow a mistake was made and the, the game master or storyteller or flame tender says, you know what, mm, that was, this game, in, you know, is hinging on this. Well, let's just, in, we are going to interpret this as such. The, also, the in, in, interpretist is not focused on the literary aspect of reaching a climax. Um, the game is not meant to, in, in this type of role player, is not meant to follow along the lines of, um, of a movie script, of a book, um, of any kind of play where you have an opening scene, where you have uh, the middle interaction and ultimately meet the bad guy. There is none of that. The interpretationist is simply concerned with having a linear foundation. If the players hang around the tavern for a while, that's okay. If they fail a bunch of rolls, oh well. If they move on to the next chapter, okay, we're going to roll some dice. If they get to the climax, if they skip one portion and go to the climax in, in the first 10 minutes of the game, that's how they play it. The dice land as they met. Also, as opposed to a narrationist, um, the narrationist tends to not ask for die rolls based on the role-playing aspect of the, of the player character. So, for example... If the players at the table are having a very good social interaction or they come up with a very great idea to, I don't know, um, unlock a wedged door in a dungeon, as long as they have described their actions, usually it's a success. They describe their actions to success, then there is assumed success. The in in interpretationist will use the die roll. Please, okay, you've talked to the barmaid. You want to gain some information from her, roll the dice. If you fail, you're, this is the point at which they interpret, well, yes, you were having a good conversation with her, but there's some reason that she has not given you this information. 
or okay, roll a strength roll plus whatever help you get if it's fifth edition D and D. Okay, roll who has the highest strength. You get advantage on it. Roll to see if you'll wed, you know wedge the door open. No, you failed. Okay, all those th you know tying a rope to it and putting you know grease on the hinges and all that. Well, sorry, the die roll said you didn't make it. Didn't work. All right. Now that's not to say that the one who interprets what happens is necessarily um, being less creative. Actually, what ends up happening is they are forced to create on the fly after the fact. So in terms of combat, um, which happens very often with the, the old bones rules of Dungeons and Dragons, you roll a high roll, you get a critical success, you roll damage, and you roll mediocre damage. How do you explain that? And the interpretationist says, well, you know, you, f you knock your arrow, you go get ready to fire it into the eye of the orc chieftain, and instead the arrow slices, makes a thin line across the orc chieftain's throat. How do you interpret it? And then the player character says, you know, elven archer says to the orc chieftain, that was a warning shot. The next one goes right into your eye. And so now you're able to use that moment to interpret what, what happens. And it takes a, it, it does take a creative hand to say, in this particular situation, the role playing of it seemed like a success. Why was there failure? Or the opposite way around. Um, your ugly, dirty barbarian stumbles into the, the clean and pristine you know, elder uh, chieftain's um, habitat and are completely at odds, but then they end up making a critical, critical success on a social role, how do you interpret those things? So, um, last, lastly, with the interpretationists, um, it is an assumption at the table as, as opposed to working along chapters and working along climax and working along... Um, spotlight and telling story that it is more or less a a discovery as we go both um, within the story and within the die rolls then there's the simulationist the simulationist is one that looks for rules to simulate the quote-unquote real world out aspects of the game and a simulationist tends to run more towards a rules heavy or um, non using less adjudication and more or less hey what are the drowning rules what are the starvation rules what rules do we have for fumbles or crits what rules do we have for healing and disease um, the simulationist uh, tends to fall more towards um, uh, rules that describe what happens as opposed to the the immersionist or narrationist um, aspects of tell me what happens. Instead, the simulationist wants to look at the rules and say, what do the rules say happened in this particular situation? Now, you might say, well, Dave, you're probably going to say, well, you know, a simulationist is probably bad um, because no rule system can completely encapsulate the realities of any game world. So, for example, the situation um, in Lord of the Rings where, um, where uh, the ranger, um, played by Viggo Morrison, and I just forgot his name, Aragorn, is fighting on the back of a giant warg trying to kill the orc, it kills the orc, or maybe it was a goblin or something. I think it was an orc, orokai. Kills it, his foot gets trapped in, in one of the stirrups, he gets dragged along, the warg uh, runs off a cliff and slips off the, the edge of the cliff, and everyone thinks he's dead. And not too many rule systems, unless you just roll a straight-up fumble, um, would allow for that. Like, okay, well, your foot gets caught in the stirrup, and then the warg kind of like, you know, runs randomly off the edge of a thing. There aren't too many rules for that. Um, and I would say that would be a bad thing because very few rule, sis, 
very few few game systems are complete simulationist systems. Uh, GURPS is, um, in my opinion, is probably one of the better simulationist systems because they have rules for and and put out a, a large number of excellent uh, splat books and setting uh, things on everything from how do you adjudicate having a knife to your throat while you're asleep to drowning rules to uh, su surviving naked in a vacuum and what happens to your body. GURPS has some excellent, excellent books on that and uh, and tries to, has gone deeply into how do you use that rule in a game system. But what, well, what are the benefits of a simulationist? Well, simulationist um, knows that as well as all the players and the game master that um, when in doubt the rules will tell us what to do and there will be no problems using any interpretation, any narration or immersive um, questions. So for example in in the case of the player who rolls the crit and rolls low damage we are not going to make up what happens. We're going to look into the rules, and that way, that completely prevents anyone from saying, well, hey, my character should have gotten an advantage in this situation. There's less chance of, um, of conflict between players and Game Master, and the, the books tell the story. What the rule says goes, we're done, move on to the next spot. Uh, simulationists tend to have a far... Um, as numbers go, tend to have a far smoother ride, especially when they know the, the game system. Because everyone knows, hey, we, we roll the dice for this, we add these modifiers, um, this is what happens, we're done. Boom. Next round. Let's go. Grab dice, go ahead. That is not to say the simulationist does not have a storyline. Um, the simulationist tends to follow storylines um, far more stricter than any of the, uh, the ones that I've said before, the immersionists. And they understand that, for example, um, one round of combat might be, you know, 10 seconds or something. And so if an NPC starts to talk and maybe, you know, maybe starts to brag about their, you know, evil schemes... Well, that NPC only has 10 seconds of talking before I get to take my action. I throw my dagger into the NPC's throat and try to kill him while he's distracted, uh, waving his fists and twirling his mustache, talking about his plans. An immersionist or narrationist probably would not interrupt the social context for that, but the simulationist says, hey, listen, we've got... We've got 10 second rounds, everybody gets their 10 seconds, we move on. They're, the, they are on a time schedule uh, as far as the rules go because the rules establish a time schedule. A simulationist also um, tends to have a far greater understanding of the nuances of a game system that has a large set of rules. There are those... Uh, players who um, absolutely love a uh, hero system, GURPS, thinking of some other game, um, Pathfinder and all of the splat books, any game system that has more than three or four splat books, um, Warhammer 40k, um, all of the books for uh, classic uh, vampire, werewolf, uh, mage, and combining all of these things together and learning all the nuances. Um, wow, what's another one? Um, Exalted, uh, Role Master, um, Rune Quest might fit in there. Uh, I, I know I'm missing a lot of these games that have a far greater front end impact on the game, meaning that there's a large. Um, buy-in into the rule system uh, for the simulationist, but those that master the games are able to very quickly um, find out what the rules are, what the modifiers are, roll the dice, get to it, and are not bogged down or 
intimidated by the expanded rule set that some of these games have. Now, the last one is the, the Operationist. And the difference between the Operationist and the Simulationist is that the Simulationist understands that within the setting, the rules exist to describe the setting, right? And although they are falling heavily on the rules that describe the setting, they understand, they do understand that there are times when the rules do not adequately describe what the event is. We're going to use the rules to describe what the event is um, to the best of our ability. But there is a, a great opportunity, uh, there's a great chance that we are going to come across a rule set that does not adequately describe the situation. Um, do the best that we can uh, adjudicate if necessary because that may be part of the rules and maybe one day they will have a rule set for drowning or vacuum or disease. But the operationist uh, is far more closely related to say a war gamer and that, all, that the rules themselves may not adequately describe what's going on, but because it's in the rules, that is what says goes. For example, um, let's take the range of an arrow or the range of a spell, and that range might be 60 feet. And in a simulationist aspect, they say, okay, um, you, cock, you, you knock your arrow, you draw back, you fire your arrow, um, but you are just out of range. You cast your spell, your spell fires out, lightning leaves your hand, um, but it is just out of range. And that may not be appropriate for the setting. And so if, if there is in the rules an adjudication on this, well, you know what? That fireball spell, if it explodes in a, inside of the dungeon, hmm, let's see, it's a narrow hallway. It would... Instead of being a, a big giant orb, it will probably extend both directions further down the hallway and down back. Don't you guys agree? Yes, in the rules it says it has this much area effect. Yes, it, the fireball, instead of being a big round orb in a in a 10-foot narrow hallway, would extend down both ends. Oh, okay. The operationist is far more concerned with uh, utilizing the numbers and the rules in the game system as opposed to the setting of the game system. So... An operationist says, hey, the spell has a 60-foot range. I'm going to stand at 65 feet and stay right out of its range. Um, not very smart in a quote-unquote realistic setting. Let's say someone's firing mortar shells or bullets. Um, I would not personally want to risk my life to stand five feet out of the maximum range of a mortar shell or a bullet. But the operationist is more concerned with how do, our, how do my numbers match with the other numbers. And there can be some strange, weird conflicts. For example, uh, the classic uh, Dungeons & Dragons um, conundrum is, hey, I've got 53 hit points. Someone holds a knife to my neck. Well, I know a dagger only does 1d4. Um, there's no way that they can kill me. Um, operationists understand that there is a heavy metagame uh, aspect to it. Um, you know your modifiers. You're aware of your ranges, you're aware of five-foot moves and, and opportunities of attack, and are far more willing to accept the fact that, um, in the, whether in the setting or not, that there is somehow this uh, intrinsic information is able to pass through the player characters and the game master about uh, specifics on where they're located, um, ranges and effects of spells, ranges and effects of weapons, and that um, the numbers control the story aspect. So, for example, a barbarian that runs into a battle to be hacked up knowing that there is a uh, cleric or a healer in the group to heal them um, allows them to become more of a tank and to absorb far more damage. There is the character who is able to uh, sneak around and um, flank and or backstab those individuals, knowing that that backstabber is able to, to um, deliver 
large amounts of damage from the back. And so we'll use uh, very many elements to say, okay, how do we uh, uh, give a greater bonus to that person's ability to cause damage? Now that's not, as, that's not to say that an operationist doesn't understand the setting, whether it's medieval, sci-fi, superhero, but uh, the rules have established numbers and uh, statistics and the operationist is not willing to uh, alter those because it would break the, the understanding with all those at the table that this, these are how the numbers operate. And by interpreting how those numbers operate, um, you change the reality at the table. Um, if there is a bonus of a plus two, uh, the operationist does not allow that bonus to modify up or down unless it is within that rule system to do so. Because that way all players at the table are on a, in, in essence an equal playing field. Hey, this is, these are how the numbers work. Let me open up the book. This is how the book operates. Um, the operationist is far more willing to use a splat book actions. Um, I'm going to combine the statistics from this book plus the statistics from that, that book to come out with this uh, rule setting. We're going to use the rule setting from these, these uh, various uh, books and this is how we're going to play the game, both from game masters and players. The operationist is far more willing to uh, accept the fact that um, there are some that although the setting may seem like this is not warranted, the rules say otherwise, and so the setting must be reinterpreted, uh, strangely enough, to accept that. For example, a character playing a halfling with, you know, an 18 strength, or a character um, casting heal spell after heal spell, um, bringing a character who's been, you know, near dead, bringing them back to life. They end up getting hit again near dead and bringing them back to life round after round. Um, the numbers say so. This must, it must be in the setting. This is how we're going to play the game. Now, of course, if, you're, if you've gotten this far into the video, you know me, that um, I'm not very much a simulationist or operationist. Eh, simulation is a little bit. Um, operation is not so much, um, but there is a value in that, especially if you're running an extremely tactical um, uh, war game or um, mass combat kind of deal, because you're going to want to know what the rules are, what what the outcome is, and therefore you have zero conflict with the rules. You have the operationist is probably the the only one of the, the five that I mentioned that has, um, has had zero conflict when it comes to what happens to my player character, what happens to the, you know, the creatures, what are the stat blocks, what are the rules. You flip a book open, you find the page number, it says this, done. Now, using all of those, uh, immersionist, narrationist, interpretationist, uh, simulationist, and operationist, um, Using all of those, where do you guys find yourself at, and do you think I missed something? I know there's nuances in there, um, but I tried to make it as simple as possible, if that's possible to say that I made it simple. But uh, where do you guys fall into it? Of course, I'm going to list this below, so you don't have to go through the whole damn video to, to find it out. But I'd like to find out um, whether you think I've missed something. Um, I'm pretty sure I probably made the simulation as an operation to seem a little bit negative just because it's my own, from my own uh, uh, viewpoint. Um, I apologize for those players that are far more on that side, um, but I'm admitting that, that I am biased in, in this, particular, um, th this particular video series. So anyway, where are you guys at? Um, I challenge you guys to give, to give out your numbers. And I'd love some video responses on this and where do you fall in. And has anyone changed the way they've done things, especially now with um, greater technology, um, Kickstarter games, um, free games. Um, since the, you know, my 
experiences from 1975 or 77 when I first started playing Dungeons and Dragons, things have changed dramatically. And my gaming style has changed. I've grown, I've learned things from new people. Um, I'm always learning, even though, uh, like Frank Fett, Frey, um, I'm an old geezer. Um, I'd like to hear some of your opinions. And, um, you know, as always, as always, I sign off with, you know, create, don't destroy. Uh, create some dialogue out there and, uh, you know, try try to keep, you know, the, the negative portions of your your comments. I know a lot of times we feel very deeply about how we game and our own particular gaming style. But le um, keep an open mind and try to lean from one to the other. If you've noticed when I created my five types, um, immersion, kitty, jeez, immersion, narration, interpretation, simulation, operation. I've gone from one one far range to the other and you know there's people who fall somewhere in the middle. Um, have you gone from one dynamic to another? Um, you know and uh, for those out there please don't destroy anybody's idea of what they think role-playing is. Just add to what they have. If they are a war gamer, a tactical person and you want to show them more of a, of a immersive gaming style Maybe you have to meet somewhere in the middle. Be more of a, you know, interpret the rules. Maybe you want to narrate the rules a little bit better. Or simulate some things and start to draw people to your side. As, a po uh, as well as those that are more on the immersive side. Maybe you play games like Vampire, Within the Ring of Fire, um, Numenera, or something of that nature. And someone wants to draw you more into a uh, combat-heavy you, you, you know, a statistic-based kind of game and mindset, maybe there's something you can learn from that. Um, you know, there's, there's those of us that, you know, want to get into the addition wars, which you've loved and hated about them, but there are those players out there that are, um, I would say, grandmasters of their own style, and maybe you can learn something from their style and how they do it. So anyway, this is a DBJ and... Sophie, hey Sophie, yeah, trying to be some little clickbait there. Um, anyway, DBJ and Sophie, and we're out.